so yeah, so hi. Um, I'll be talking about immutable, immutable data trees in JavaScript today. Um, so first, a bit uh, about myself. So my name is Szymon Witamborski. Uh, this is where you can find me. Um, so where I come from, apart from the country I come from, um, basically I come from closure world. When um, in my university time, we were allowed to uh, write our uh, assignments in any language we, we could, so we wanted. So I, w I just just closure. And I wrote this library, because they, m most of them had GUIs, um, I wrote this library GUI for the win, and actually it was pretty much looked like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, so it actually brought me to uh, web development. Um, I just figured, why did I just didn't use it? It's there, right? So, um, so something, something's about Clojure. It's functional program language. It has very cool immutable data structures, and it's a Lisp. Um, but today we'll be only um, worried about the middle one, and we'll be actually stealing from Clojure those immutable data structures. Um, so, whoops, I think we are getting too far. Yeah. So, why would we want to actually to, to uh, have immutab immutability in our programs? So, one thing is to enforce separation between m functions, modules, or third-party code. Um, that pretty much explains itself, I think. Uh, So basically, we don't want anybody like messing with our stuff. Um, so we want to avoid side effects uh, of one thing changing state of another. So if you pass value or a collection from function to function, you don't really want the other function to uh, modify the state of your object. Um, you probably want to enforce it somehow. Um, the same goes for other modules or other like third-party code, like widgets on your on a, that's also on your on your website. Um, so all, so why immutability? Security. Um, if there's a third-party code um, that we don't necessarily trust, we we would want immut immutability in our data to um, forbid it from changing it in, at any event. Um, so if you want actually to enforce it, we <coughs> might want to just copy the data and give the other party um, a copy of it so it won't actually mess with our internal state. Um, but we might want to avoid it by just using smart immutability that I will just explain today how, how we can do that. Um, so the things I described is basically um, different ways of sharing state. So when we pass data from one place to another, be it function, module, or third-party code, um, uh, we can do it with a convention, for example. So we say these are a set of rules that we abide to um, in our organization. So one convention could be um, with sending data, just mutable data, um, what convention would be uh, that the data belongs to the sender and the receiver shouldn't modify it. So whenever I get some data, I assume that I can't change it um, and I have to create my own copy if I want to do anything with it. Um, the other convention could be data belongs to the receiver and sender shouldn't modify. Um, wait, did I, did I say it the other way? Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, it was, it was good. Um, so basically, whenever we um, send the data, uh, we assume that it belongs to the receiver. So the sender is basically assuming that whenever we want, he wants to um, do something with it, he will have to create a copy. So the third convention is that both sender and receiver can modify it. And this is pretty much a strategy because both sender and um, Receiver in this at uh, this t this time are basically coupled very closely together because you um, have to um, take into, into account that the other module can change your data at any time, which is um, just asking for for bugs basically here. Um, so you won't probably want to use w number one or number two. Um, and I'm not really big fan of conventions because um, somebody at some point will break them. Um, 
So a newcomer will probably break it. The first thing they do probably is just break it uh, because they don't know about them. Um, you will probably break it at some point um, because you forgot about the convention or had a bad day. Um, or you have to just like rush because you have to fix something very quickly, quickly. So, and uh, there's other thing about third party code that you're in your organization agree to these conventions <coughs> with somebody that's writing a third party code that runs on your website, it's not actually um, abiding to it. Even if it's like, even if it's like just a library, not necessarily a widget or something. So we have those things called computers and we can make computers enforce our conventions basically instead of making people remember them. I think that's a, that's a win um, in this case because we don't have to remember and they are, they are enforced and everybody that comes in is um, abiding to the conventions because it's, there's no other way a uh, computer tells them to. So the other way um, of we are, we are now back to sharing state between things. So we can do object freeze, that's what ES5 does, uh, gives us. And that basically means that um, we are freezing, we are for, for, forbidding for modifying the thing um, to any, by anyone. Um, but there's a, there's a catch here that it has to be recursively uh, for full immu immutability. So if you have a tree of, of objects, um, we have to recursively traverse the whole tree, make everything sure, to make sure that everything is immutable. Um, and any modification, we have to do a full copy of things that we modify, even if it's like a part of a tree. Well, we have to then c clone this part of the tree, make it immutable um, in the process and make our modification and probably again freeze it. So, and that was also only ES5 browser, so no, uh, no i8 here. Um, but I think the best way is to do it with a function and this is probably the most secure and portable way um, because we make the state private to a function with a closure um, so if we're going to pass it to a function it returns a function that has it in a closure then and the function controls access to its data and whatever rules we impose um, they are programmed in this function so now let's jump to a, another subject, how we can actually make those um, immutable data structures behave nicely um, with like, nice performance and stuff like that. So there's something called multi-version concurrency, concurrency control, uh, which unfortunately has the um, acronym is MVCC, which is very close to MVC, um, but just bear with it. Um, so my main characteristics are that the data is immutable, it's versioned, and the MVC comp is quite concept is quite old because it, it was in DBs, like relational da databases, for, for years and actually decades um, for transactions, stuff like that. And it's quite recently adopted by Clojure, Haskell, or Scala, and like in memory, um, in memory systems or in RAM systems. So basic uh, assumptions is that each version is immutable and each mutation creates a new version. Um, that's basically it. Um, the, that's the concept. Um, so in the piece, it was originally for that the writes don't block, re don't block reads, which is pretty important with like concurrent access to a database. And then readers never seen consistent state because the new versions are accumulated in our transactions and that can be even rolled back. And the transaction isn't like committed to the data database un unless um, it's, it's committed and it's not rolled back. So closures, persistent data structures, are, are basically implementation of MVCC. Uh, so they do pretty cool stuff. Um, and mine of it is this sharing of the structure or the data between, uh, between versions. So version zero, it's, let's say it's a full full version, full um, tree, and then uh, when you create a new version, only part of it is affected by the, by the update. So the, only the part of it is copied to a new version, and the, the new version like points to data in the old version. That's basically my main concept here. 
So collections, um, collection is internally a tree instead of being a flat. So instead of having a flat array, we have um, basically trees that um, actually I would explain it la later in a better with our pictures and stuff. And it gets, gets nice, nice performance characteristics and um, like logarithmic performance characteristics. Um, so this tractor chain saves RAM and saves operations with creating new versions. Um, that's main wins here. Um, so the lookups are, um, if, you, if you see this logarithm with base 32 of the size of, of the thing, um, which until, uh, so until 32, it'll be one lookup, and after that, it'll be like two lookups until 2024 or something. Um, so how it works. Um, let's say we have this it's a very simple array. And what do we do? We create a binary, binary tree of it. Um, so instead of having a flat array, we create, we create a tree. And to do that, we um, first see the keys in binary code. Um, then we split those keys into, um, into bits, basically. And then each bit will be an address in our tree. So, um, for example, the A had address 0, 0. So the first bit was 0. The other, the other bit is 0. The S had 0, 1 because it was 1 in binary code. And then D had 1, 0, and F had 1, 1. If we, uh, cool. So lookup performance of that is basically 2 because we have the depth of the tree is 2. So there will be two lookups, um, which is um, not, really, not accidentally log base 2 of 4 because um, this is how binary trees basically basically work here. So we can, um, when we want to still with binary tree, um, when we expand the size of it, we have to actually grow the depth um, depth here. So if you want to store eight elements, we'll have to have three um, depth, depth depth of three um, because the Logarithm with base two of eight is three, uh, in this case. Um, hope that logarithms not don't scare anybody. Um, so let's. Um, so, so how can we cope with like the tree growing um, very deeply, like just gaining weight? Uh, in this case, we can increase the size of the chunks that we divide the key to. So in this example we have 16 elements, array of 16 elements, and we divide the keys into two-bit chunks. Um, so the lookup of it is now again back to two um, because we have only two levers, right? Uh, so because logarithm with base uh, four of 16 is two. Um, so to like, make it more intuitive, um, you can say that we choose two bit chunk size. Each case is four bits long. So that gives us, for each key, two chunks for two bits. Um, so, the, so the tree has to be two level deep because we split the key into two chunks. That means two lookups. So now, how can you actually make it performant? Um, let's say we increase chunk size to 5, increase array size to 32,000 something something, which is 2 to the power of 15. So the same logic. We have 15 bit, bits keys um, because logarithm, 5-bit five, five chunk size in this case. Um, so key is split to 3 chunks and three has to be three level deep. Two, three lookups for 32,000 elements. So that's, that's pretty good uh, performance, I guess. And you don't always cope with that big data, I guess. So this is a bit math. 
Um, so this is basically formalizing how we derive the uh, complexity and maybe you can just look at it later. I'll post the, uh, post the link to slides uh, on the group. Uh, that's another math. You can actually um, experiment with different configurations uh, if you just use this function, um, which basically says that like for, for five five bit keys for three two thousand you get three, for five five bit keys and two thousand twenty four you get two, and so on and so on. You can just um, look at it how how big data if you're interested how big uh, how many lookups for how big data you can get and how how was the was the optimal key um, key size. So basically for five bit chunks, you get log 32n, and that's what Clojure uses. Um, so, break. Sorry. So now let's try to mutate things. Um, so let's, so mutation is producing a new version. So we want to actually keep this version. So we are assigning it to v1, um, just to keep, keep a reference. Um, the number and the index is actually two. It's one zero in binary code. Just wanted to make it um, clear what's the address in our binary tree. Because we are right now we are back to our bina binary tree. Um, so mutation, how does, how does it work? We copy only nodes on the path to the updated leaf. Um, so if the address is like zero one, we just um, we just copy those those nodes that are on the root at the zero uh, index and later at the one index. Um, set the new value at the at the new copy of leaf of the, of the leaf that we uh, that yeah sorry. So this is what happens. And um, unfortunately, in the project projector, the color is um, not really looking too well, but all of this stuff on the bottom has basically this color. So what it means, um, all, the, all the stuff that's green, um, that's the new stuff that we allocated. And everything that's white, that's um, the old stuff that we still reference to. So you can actually see that the root node had to be copied because it is always on the path. Root node is always on the path to to a, a, any leaf, so it always has to be copied. By, but, but the zero on the root node is pointing to the whole branch of the old tree that we don't care about because we don't modify it. So we just keep the old version of it. Um, and then because we set one zero, we had to put at the index of one new copy of, of the other, of this branch and then um, so then f remains where it was and we set 0 to, um, to z because the second part of the, of the address is 0 here. So at the leaf node we set 0 index to z. Cool. Uh, so that was the most like, somebody wants to look at it a bit more? Because uh, this is like the most important thing. How can we actually accomplish uh, nice uh, performance characteristics with updates? Um, so let's do the, um, the intuitive um, uh, reasoning here. So three is log levels deep. Affected path is log nodes long. And then log new nodes has to be created because the whole path has to be recreated. Um, then each node has 32 elements. Um, so that means after we create a new node, we have to do 32 assignments, which is more or less 33 operations um, that are log 30n, uh, sorry, log 32n uh, long. But with like performance, uh, Proof we dro always drop the constants, so it's um, because it's not important. We 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 want to see the uh, order of 
of the of the um, expected performance here, not the exact value. So log 32n is again the same <coughs> the same as for lookups. It's a bit more work, so it's obviously mm, slower than slower than uh, slower than the lookup. So now with all of that in mind, um, we can return to how we want how and or why sorry how sorry, yes. why would we want to use immutable data so a case for MVC frameworks that's very often that's Ember that's Angular that's React that's anything that you use they all do the same thing they um, they ask your data is it changed in any way um, so. Because MVC frameworks ha need to know when to update the view, and the view is generated from data, so you have to you, you have to um, check if the data changed somehow. So with mutable data, either either um, one recursive check or many pinpointed checks. So, for example, in Angular, um, anytime you use a value in a um, in a view, there's a new watch um, expression called on this on this on the thing that that you bind to, um, so you have a lot of watches for everything. Basically, you have a, you have a lot of watches. Um, you can, sorry. When you do recursive checks, it's slow, and the same thing is if you have ma a very many many pinpointed checks. If you um, do recursive checks again, it's from hungry because you have to actually have two um, two copies of like an array. Um, in memory at the same time to compare each value on each position. And so that makes the MVC framework unhappy. Um, so a case for, so sorry, again. So with immutable data, um, only root reference on the root node reference has to be checked because whenever you change anything inside a tree, um, you get the new root and you have to keep this new root um, because otherwise you haven't changed anything because the other old version is immutable. Um, so that's pretty cool because the only thing that the MVC framework has to do is to check the reference on the root element. So that's just crazy, crazy, crazy fast. And it's also very more efficient if you use the structure sharing uh, that Clojure uses. So that makes the MVC framework very happy. Um, so using immutable data might actually speed up your MVC application. Um, so there, obviously, the immutable data is a bit slower than the immutable one, but when you want to do things like checking recursively if anything changed, that's just that can outweigh um, that disadvantage that it is, it is a bit slower to manipulate. Um, but you can also cho choose where, where do you use immutable data. You can either use immutable data everywhere or like on inside a function, you do, you do mutable things and uh, whenever you pass it between, you, you pass uh, mutable versions. Um, or on module boundary, you do the same thing or you do it between you and third party boundary or you use mutable data if you, if you really want to. Um, that's just up to you. That's your choice. But in a functional program, and a like perfect maybe functional program, you would um, make the data immutable as soon as you get it from like HTTP request or file or whatever. whatever. Um, then you use Profiler, which you probably use anyway, uh, to find bottlenecks in your program. And then if the immutable data is the reason of it, you would change it to mutable. Um, but only in this small part, and as you probably should convert it back to immutable when uh, you're done doing your critical things. So, so in a functional program, mutable data is considered a type of premature optimization. Um, so you optimize with like, one of the techniques of optimizing is just making some parts of program mutable. So how do we in JavaScript? Um, there's, um, oh yeah, there's of course a quick reminder. There are things that are already immutable. There are numbers, strings, and bools, which means er any primitive types that are already immutable. Um, 
so you don't need to do anything actually without it, and they're perfect. Um, so we have existing libraries, which is one, one of which is Mori, which is probably most popular. It derives uh, direct from Clojure via Clojure script, and it's basically a JavaScript wrapper for Clojure script um, collections. Um, the main thing that I found with it, like my main problem, is that it, you give it a tree, and the only root level is immortalized, sorry, immu made immutable. Um, so basically, it's non-recursive. Whenever you pass it a tree, only the root node will be um, Im immortalized, and the other other parts will remain as they were. So this is the same. This is the same situation as with object freeze. You have to do it recursively by yourself. Um, so yeah, so I just mentioned it. It's just basically the whole collection API from Closure Script. It's pretty cool if you want it. It's very powerful. Um, so that's the thing. Yeah, of course. Um, but I wanted to experiment a, a bit with um, both interface and implementation, and I've created Ancient Oak, um, which is basically Clojure uh, immutable data library for JavaScript data trees, which really emphasizes on trees, because um, it seems like nobody is doing it this way. Um, so what do you get? So you give it whole tree of data. Um, Ancient you know, Oak processes, processes it recursively, um, so you don't need to wrap anything um, by, by hand. Sorry. So what it does, you give it a, um, a data, and it gives you a function that basically cards the access to this data to the whole tree. Um, with various update iterate methods um, on, on that function. So, example, you give it a very simple tree with an array inside, and you get a function with like set patch map and there's a bunch of others. Um, so, also, yeah, it's very easy to get the data in and data out, and they are basically have always the same um, structure. They never types are never changed, they're preserved. So. Basically, that's, that's pretty much self-explainable. So every node of the tree actually is a tree of its own. So you can always take a part of a tree, for example, in this, this part, we're interested only in the B array. Um, so we just get the B from the tree, and we get another, another uh, tree. Um, so this is like the main assumptions why we can actually do it recursively, is that we have one-to-one -one mapping between native JavaScript types and immutable types. Um, so whenever there's an array, there's only one type that's transferred to when, when we immortalize it. Um, so for example, array is, uh, as with uh, JavaScript arrays, is sorted on un unsigned integer keys. And the difference is, only difference is here is that um, size reported in the size property instead of length uh, because it's a function. Length is reserved for the number of function ar arguments. Um, object is just unsorted map with string keys. The same constraints as with um, uh, JavaScript objects. So um, main assumptions are that functions and primitive types are treated as immutable because functions are assumed to be interfaces to data. So the getters. So whether there's a function, it assumes that as another tree of data somewhere there. So this actually uh, makes it um, good for storing plain data, but not really for anything else. So if you want to store like um, module interfaces in it, that's probably not a good idea. At this moment, maybe um, we, can, uh, we can do something, else, something with it that will make it um, doable. So let's just go quickly through the API and we'll be done. Um, so the main part of the API is the I, big I, um, which is the immortalizer. Um, I'm not sure about this yet. Um, if sh I should use the capital I, like global variable, um, that's maybe not the, the, the best idea. Um, but that's just for this example, I think that's um, enough. So basically. The data is a function 
Um, if you get the A, you get the number. It's already immutable, so we don't do anything. We just return as it is. Um, you get B, you get a function, because it's, um, it's, the, it's the getter for the array. And then if you want to get the um, a value from that array, you basically pass it, uh, pass it in the index. So you can, um, just as you would chain the square brackets with multiple nested things, you can do the same thing by just like parentheses, which makes it for a very um, easy, easy understanding and transition how to use them um, compared to immutable data. Um, so that's the same, then that's the same array. We just do here dump and JSON, so we can very uh, easy way to, to um, get it get it from. Um, so set is always returning a new version here. So in this example, we do two sets. We set C to five, A to four. Um, so the C to five returns a new version, and then on this version, we do another modification basically here. Um, I just, just wanted to show that we can chain them easily. So if you do dump on the, the, on the V0, we can see that it's still unchanged. If you do dump on V1, uh, then both modified um, variables, sorry, um, fields will be there. Um, then remove removes an address in a tree. So in this example, we say rm remove um, b, sorry, d inside b. So first get, get to, the, to, to the b subtree, and from that, uh, we remove the D. So you can see that um, when you dump it, um, the B is still there, but the D from B is missing. Sorry about the, those names. They should probably uh, be uh, like G and K. So we don't, uh, they don't sound sim so similar. So, similar. Um, so uh, update is just applying, um, it's like one of map. You just map a value on one, one thing, basically. Um, so we update one version. We get the value, and um, it's, it's in the A is here, increased by one. Um, patch. I think this is the coolest thing here, actually. This is um, uh, how it works. You give it a diff of the tree that you apply on the, on the old tree. So in this example, we have A field, B array, and uh, that has some stuff in it. So we say set A to two, and inside B, set zero to four and three to five. So those numbers in the B are actually indexes. Um, so when we do dump, we can see that A is updated to two, and inside B, the zero index is updated to four, and the three index is updated to five. There's an empty element between of, never mind. Um, so iteration, that's boring stuff, because it's always look the same. Uh, currently for each map and reduce, mostly the same na uh, semantics as native. Um, I just want to be compatible here. Um, only reduce is a bit incompatible, but it's just, that's an easy fix. We always require um, the init value for reduce, but that can be changed very easily. Um, so uh, one thing about map that's interesting maybe, that it always returns uh, the same type, type of the collection as the original. So un unlike underscore, for example, which you, if you do map on an object, it will give you an array. Here we um, assign for the same keys the returned values. So we just increase every value in this array. Um, but the ta type keys remain the same. Um, another thing. Uh, if you have, if you use data as a function, you can do crazy things like you're applying data on top of other data um, here. Um, so what it actually means that the data will be called with first A, then B and then C, and so what it means is that we first get the first iteration would get the get one, the second iteration would get B, which means two, and the third iteration would get C, which is three. So you can do that if you, that's your thing. Uh, actually, in Clojure, that's very common to use this uh, kind of thing, uh, even to like create, um, sorry, like if two sets and you want to like the common uh, part of, of them, then you would 
apply one set on a top of the other set, something like that. Um, so about ancient Gog, it's still early stage, experimental. Um, the target is to handle j data that you can JSONify, so trees, basically, um, and not graphs uh, without any uh, loops and stuff. Um, plans are to tweak it for speed, for a really make it performant, and there are some o open things that I haven't uh, resolved yet. So for example, is the API cool or, or not? And if you have any ideas about it, and how to store dates, because that's the, the last thing probably that's very common in, um, in pa data passed between servers and clients. Um, that we still, still don't have no um, way of storing it. Either you can just put in a string, but that's not really um, a data. And the, uh, the perfect way would be to have a way to interface with date getters and setters that will each time create a new version. Um, so if you have any suggestions how to uh, handle this, I'll be very, very, um, it will be very nice to hear. So that's pretty much it. And any resources for you is very cool um, post by Jean Niklas Lorange. Um, I, I hope that this is how you pronounce it. Um, by how those things work together. And there are things, some, some things that I haven't covered, like uh, you have to sometimes grow and shrink the, 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 the tree. Um, the, the, the other whole structures, and there's some links like ancient we're going to have our docs where lib included, so you can actually open your de developer tools um, and start just um, experiment, uh, experiment, experimenting with it. Um, my Twitter and the talk can be found under the, um, this address. Uh, I will post the talk um, to the MVGS meetup group. So sorry, comments. Okay, okay, so we're a little bit running a little bit behind time, so let's have, do a couple quick questions. If people have that, and then we'll move on to James. Uh, cool. James, how we can start wiring you. How much did it take? How much did it take? Well, we started late, so it wasn't your. Oh, uh, okay. Seven thirty now, so we just. Okay. Uh, so in terms cool. Of the questions. Uh, yeah. So because the browser is single thread, how is immutable data going to help me? So it's so in the closure, um, it's. The immutable data, one of the reasons is that because you have multiple threads and you have um, uh, yeah, conflicts when they like override each other. So the, in here, mainly, the reason why you want to do it is the uh, security. Um, yep. Um, and also the MVC uh, scenario here. I was thinking that this is cool. Um, but yeah, you don't have multiple threads. Um, but it's still, if you want to pass data from one, from one thing to another, I think it's nice to have this guarantee that they won't modify my data. That's the main reason, basically. And so, so why not just using ClojureScript? Yeah, I had actually a slide on it. Um, but I for, uh, thought, uh, hey, somebody will just ask a, que a question about this. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you're fine with Clojure and ClojureScript, you can just use it. And I was really interested, how can we do that in plain JavaScript? Um, and the chase of language is usually very um, subjective. Um, and in my opinion, JavaScript is a good enough language. And I really like just doing stuff with functions and uh, plain data. Um, you can do it in, in Clojure, too. Um, yeah, I just don't, there's, th there's a reason what I don't use, for example, CoffeeScript. That's just my, my, uh, my preference. JavaScript is not bad enough to be replaced. And it's good enough for my, uh, for my stuff. Yeah, so that's just basically uh, uh, subjective. You can, yeah. Maybe technical reasons that Clojure is quite big. Clojure scripts is big too, I guess. You don't want to be have big, big stuff, sorry, big um, third party library in your, in your code, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. If the, if the um, outcome of it is that uh, you will try CoffeeScript, that I will be very happy because CoffeeScript is cool and Clojure is cool. So, yeah. Any other questions? No, cool. Well, thanks. Thanks, guys.